Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are going to study a very important module in international human rights law called Prevention of Torture in International Law. I'm sure everybody of you must have heard about the word torture sometime or the other in your lifetime. Now let me ask you a small question. What comes to your mind when I use the word torture, when I utter the word torture? I'm sure, if not all, the following things must have come to your mind, like causing of grave pain in custody, a severe beating, thrashing, headbanging, etc., forceful ringing of urine, often heard and reported, striking with rifle butt, food deprivation, or forcible feeding with spoiled food, cigarette burning, burning by heated rods, rape, or threat thereof, and sexual abuse. I'm sure these you must have come across in your lifetime, maybe by reading newspapers or through different sources of media or internet. Now, as I said, today we are going to study the prevention of torture in international law. Now, let me tell you how I'm going to proceed with the module presentation. The presentation of module is divided in two parts. Part A will deal with the international law on torture. In this, we will discuss about the important principles of prevention of torture in international law. We will discuss about the important ingredients of torture in international law. We will discuss about the important cases decided by the International Court in, on torture in international law. And part B, simultaneously, will concentrate on the prevention of torture in India. We will try to see what provisions we have in India We deals to check the prevention of torture. We will also try to concentrate on the lapsed Torture Bill 2010 and obviously the revised bill which is presently pending consideration under the Home Ministry. Now let's start. Well, as I said, what comes to your mind when I use the word torture and what exactly is torture? I'm sure everybody will agree that torture is a violation of basic human rights which affects the human dignity, it affects human personality, it affects your individuality, it affects your self-respect. And this is one of the most gruesome and most biggest atrocity which, is, which can be committed against any human being. And the whole acceptance of torture as an offense, it all started after the Nazis' atrocity which were committed in Germany. The international world thought that they should have a convention in place which can check such atrocities being committed against the individuals and the perpetrators of the crime can be punished. And therefore, our convention on international convention on prevention of torture in international law was adopted. Now let me tell you, the prohibition of torture in international law has been universally prohibited. And this is further evident from Article 5 of UDHR, that is Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which says, no one shall be subject to torture or cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Similar prohibitions are contained in other international human rights instruments like Article 7 of ICCPR, that is International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 3 of European Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedom. Similarly, Article 5 of African Charter on Human and People Rights and Article 5 of the American Convention on Human Rights. And of course, last but not the least, Article 19 of the 1949 Geneva Conventions. They all contain a similar prohibition which states that torture in no circumstances be committed against human beings. Now, having discussed all this, we really have come to a position where we need to understand what exactly is the definition of torture and how it has been defined, and defined under the Torture Convention. Well, the most authoritative definition of torture can be found in Article 1 of the Torture Convention. Let's see what Article 1 of the Convention Against Torture has to say. The term torture has been defined as any act, mind my words, any act by which severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, is inf intentionally inflicted on a person. I repeat, means any act by which severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted on a person. For purposes, now this is very important. The following things should be committed with the purpose. If it is not committed with the following purposes, which has been mentioned under the convention, it will not amount to a torture. Now what are the purposes? For purposes such as, Obtaining from him or third person information or confession. This is one. Second, punishing him for an act he or the third person has committed or suspected of having committed. This is second. 
The third is intimidating or coercing him or a third person. And the fourth, of course, is very wide in nature, which international courts often use to bring different actions under the definition of torture, and that is, for any reason based on discrimination of any kind. We will deliberate on all the four purposes in the later part of my slides, where I'll discuss in detail what exactly they are. Further, the convention says that it defines torture as such pain or suffering should be inflicted by or at the instigation of or with the consent or acquiescence of a public official or by any person, he can be a private person, acting in an official capacity. So this is the fourth requirement. Such action should be committed by any person. It can be a public servant or he can be acting at the instigation of a public servant, at the instance of a public servant, in connivance of a public servant or any private person who is acting under some official capacity. Further, there is a qualification given under a definition, and that is a kind of exception. It says that it does not include pain or suffering arising only from inherent in or incidental to lawful sanction. It means that, suppose, if a policeman is going to catch a thief, and for that purpose he uses a reasonable force, so that will not amount to torture because that is incidental to or inherent to the lawful sanction being exercised by a public authority. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, we will discuss the four important essentials or ingredients of the definition of torture. So the essentials are, the first is intentional infliction. Second is causing of severe pain and suffering. The third is for one of the enumerated purposes. And fourth is state action on or on its behalf, which we just had discussed. Now, coming to the first part, the intentional infliction. You read in the definition of torture, which I just discussed, that the action should be committed intentionally. If the action is not committed intentionally, it will not amount to a torture. Now, there is something we need to understand. The intention cannot always be expressed. The intention can be implied, and one can also infer intention from the conduct of the state parties. Well, for that, I'll give you an example. There is a famous case decided by the European Court of Human Rights. It's called Simone versus France. In this case, what happened was that there was a person, he was taken into police custody. When he was taken into police custody, he was absolutely in good health. But when he was released from the police custody, there were marks of injuries on his body. The International Court presumed that he has been subjected to torture. In short, I just want to say that the court, in this case, inferred the element of intention from the conduct of the parties and that were evident from the marks of injury which were put on the body of the person who was taken into custody. Similarly, there is another important case decided by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. It is called Morales versus Guatemala. Again, in this case, the court relied on the circumstantial evidence which were caused on the body of the victim to conclude that the perpetrator had an intent to commit torture. Now, what will those circumstantial evidence? They were beating, tying, visible cuts and burns on the victim's face. So the court, after going through this, after looking at the injuries, it relied on circumstantial evidence and said, no, yes, the, there was an intent on the part of the perpetrator to commit an action, to commit torture. So what I want to say is that international courts infer intention from the conduct of the state parties. Now, as you remember, the second most important element of causing torture was that severe pain or suffering should be caused. I repeat, severe pain or suffering should be caused. Now, it is nowhere defined under the convention what exactly is severe pain and suffering. And therefore, the international courts have taken the liberty to define, to interpret in a much liberal and a broader manner. Well, the common practice of the international court is while defining severity of harm or suffering is the minimal level of severity depends on all circumstances of the case, such as treatment of the victim, its physical or mental effects, and in some cases, the victim's age, sex, and state of health. Well, you need to understand one more important case to understand what exactly is severe pain and suffering and how the international courts have interpreted and how the international courts have defined severe pain or suffering. Again, this was decided in this case of Simone versus France, which we previously discussed when we were discussing about the intentional element. The court in this case relied on the medically certified traumas in the body, which were inflicted by sustained beating occurring over a period of days, such as punches, kicks, and blows with trenchine and basketball. And this constituted torture. According to the court, 
The injuries were caused by sustained beating, by punches, kicks, blows, by trenching and on basketball. And this constituted torture. This is what the coach says. Similarly, another important case decided by ICTY, that is International Criminal Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia. The name of the case is Prosecutor versus Bird Jenin. In this case, the court gave two tests, that is objective severity and the subjective severity to understand what is severe pain and suffering. According to the court, the subjective, the objective severity of harm inflicted is the nature of the harm, the purpose of the harm and the consistency of the act committed against the victim. So this should be taken into consideration while assessing the severe pain and suffering. And the subjective criteria is, as given by the court, physical or mental condition of the victim has to be taken into consideration. What exactly is the physical and mental condition? Under what trauma he or she is going through? The effects of the treatment on the victim, the victim's age, sex, state of health, and of course, the position of inferiority will be taken into consideration to define the gravity of the harm as per the decision of the international courts. Now, we are coming to the third and the most important element to bring a uh, act under the definition of torture. That is the purpose requirement. You must be remembering, I stated to you long back in my first slide, in the, actually in the second slide, what are the purposes? Now tell, let me tell you, the torture, the convention against torture has given four different purposes. But let me tell you again is that all the four different purposes which has been mentioned are merely illustrative in nature. They are merely illustrative in nature. It means that Different purposes may be interpreted, different purposes may be brought to define an act as torture. Now let's see what the four purposes are which has been provided under the torture convention. The first is obtaining from the detainee or third person information or confession. This is quite clear. Second is punishing him for an act he or third person has committed or is suspected of having committed. The second purpose. The third purpose is intimidating or coercing, coercing a detainee or a third person. And fourth, is very interesting for us to understand. For any reason based on discrimination of any kind. This says for any reason based on discrimination of any kind. So international courts have really used the fourth purpose. That is for any reason based on discrimination of any kind to bring different purposes which are not mentioned under the convention to define an act as an act of torture. Well, let me draw your attention to the general comment number two, given by the Committee Against Torture, which says that gender and sexual violence can fall under the umbrella of torture as discrimination of any kind, which I just told you instantly. So gender and sexual violence, if committed with the intention to cause some injury, can be brought under the purview of torture. Another important case decided by the ICTY is prosecutor versus Delalich. In this case also, the court says the illustration given under the torture convention are merely illustrative in nature and it further says that there is no requirement that a conduct in caution be solely perpetrated for a prohibited purpose. It means if a conduct is being done for a different purpose which is not mentioned under the convention that can also be brought under the purview of torture convention. And last but not the least, there is another important case decided by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. It's Major versus Peru. In this case, the court says, an act of rape by a state official constitutes torture when its purpose is to punish and intimidate the victim. So it's quite clear that the four purposes mentioned under the convention are merely illustrative in nature and different purposes can be brought and have been brought by the international courts to define an act as an act of torture. Now we are coming to the fourth and the last important element of convention against torture. It says state action or on its behalf. This is very important for us to understand. What is state action or on its behalf? State action is quite clear that a person who is a government servant is committing an act of torture or any person who at the instance or at the instigation or with the connivance is committing an act of torture. Quite clear. But the state participation nowadays has been really interpreted very liberally by the international courts. No, this is quite clear when you read and understand the judgment of this case called Jed and others versus United Kingdom decided by the European Court of Human Rights. It says that state participation criteria is not only fulfilled 
when the state is committing some act of torture. It is also fulfilled when the state has avoided, is neglecting its duty to pro prohibit acts of torture being committed under its jurisdiction or it has failed to protect its individual from the acts of torture. This is what the court says. So we will all agree with the fact that it's the duty of the state to protect its, protect its individual from torture being committed against them or protect all its citizens from any action committed by any private individual under its territory. So even if a private individual is committing an act of torture against some other citizen, it is the duty of the court, it's the duty, sorry, it's the duty of the state to prohibit such action and protect its citizen. So this is what the court says in this. Let me tell you, the court states, state must take measures to ensure that individuals within their particular jurisdiction are not subject to torture or ill treatment, including ill treatment administered by private individuals. In further states, since the state knew or should have known that the, such actions may be committed, it's the duty of the state to protect and prohibit such acts of torture being committed against the individual. So this cast a positive duty on the state to prohibit such actions from happening. Another important case decided by the ICTY is prosecutor versus Kunarak. Uh, this is a very interesting case and we all are supposed to know and remember that according to the court in this case it says that public official requirement it's not a requirement under customary international law. It's not at all a requirement under customary international law and just a requirement under the torture convention. So when we say that it's not a requirement under customary international law, this increases the status to the just cogens, which means that state cannot negate its duty of prohibiting such acts of torture being committed under the state territory. And state has a positive duty to protect its citizen against any act of torture committed against them, even by a non-state actor. Similarly, the last but not the least, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. It also says that the state action requirement was satisfied when public officials were unwilling to provide effective protection from ill treatment, including in treatment by non-state actors. So this is quite explanatory. Now we are coming to the second part of the presentation, which where I will very briefly deal with the important provisions of the Torture Convention. Well, the Torture Convention has taken a lot from the Declaration of Torture, which was adopted by the General Assembly on December 9, 1975. This was the first international condemnation of the practice of torture in the international world. Finally, but that was not binding, so international law, international world thought that they should adopt a convention which is binding in nature, so that states cannot go away from its responsibility to protect its surgeons. So the finally, the Torture Convention was adopted on December 10, 1984, and it was unanimously adopted by the General Assembly. And it was, of course, the legally binding instrument. And the full name of the convention was Convention Against Torture or Other Cruel, Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment. So the whole convention consists of 33 articles, all pointing towards the ultimate aim of prohibiting the acts of torture. Now let's see some of the important provision. Let's rush through it. Well, Article 2 casts a duty on the states which have ratified the convention that they have that's supposed to take effective legislative, administrative, judicial or other measures to prevent acts of torture. The further says that, it further says that state cannot shield its responsibility of protecting its citizen by taking the defense of extreme situation in a public emergency, emergency. State often take this defense. So the convention has totally negated that. You cannot say, the state cannot say that it was a public emergency or there was state of war or something like that. This duty cannot be violated. This is a non-derogable duty which cannot be done away with. The state has to provide and the state cannot shield themselves under the circumstances of extreme situation or threat of war or public emergency. Article 2 further says that they also cannot shield themselves under the provision that an order for torture was given by the superior officer. That is also something negated under the torture convention following the established principles of the Nuremberg Charter. So we were studying Article 3 which state that no state party shall expel, extradite, return any person to another state where there is substantial ground of believing that he may be subject to torture. This is basically the principle of non-refoulement under the international refugee law. Article, Article 4 casts a duty on the state parties to ensure that all acts of torture should be punished 
under the domestic law. So they shouldn't take, they should make legislations to punish all acts of torture under their domestic law. Self-explanatory. Well, Article 5 through 7 is one of the most important provisions under the Torture Convention, which speaks about state condition universal jurisdiction. I repeat, it speaks about state condition universal jurisdiction. To what exactly is state condition universal jurisdiction? It means that state should initiate criminal proceedings against the perpetrator or extradite to another state where he can stand for trial. In no case, he should go scot-free. For others, it's a duty of the state to provide for territorial jurisdiction based upon the nationality of the offender and the victim. When I say based upon the nationality of the offender, I mean that suppose a person has committed acts of torture and the offender is of your country, then there should be provision in your convention that he can be extradited back and he can be punished. Similarly, jurisdiction based on the nationality of victim means if your victim, victim of your country has been tortured anywhere in the world, then this provision should be there that you can call the perpetrator and you can punish him on the basis of this jurisdiction. Article 11, it's quite simple, it speaks about systematic review of all the interrogation rules, instruction, methods and practices, as well as arrangements for the custody and treatment of persons subjected to any form of arrest, detention or imprisonment. So a state is supposed to systematically review all the provisions, all the arrangements, all the interrogation rules which they have. And they should be, of course, in tune with the international established practices. Article 2, again, speaks about that a state has a duty to impartially and properly, impromptly investigate all the actions of torture committed under their jurisdiction. Article 30 speaks about filing complaint with the authorities of the state against the acts of torture. Article 14 is another important provision of the Torture Convention which speaks about compensation to the victims of torture. It says that adequate provisions should be made in the domestic legislation where the state should provide for convention, compensation to the victims of torture as well as their full rehabilitation. So this is there under the Torture Convention. Article 15 speaks about any statement made as a result of torture shall, shall be excluded from evidence basically following the principles of criminal law. Article 16 is another important provision, but it exclusively deals with the cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment and punishment and rights uh, extended to torture has also been given and extended to the torture in, in cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment or punishment. That is Article 10, Article 11 speaks about systematic review of integration rules, Article 12 that speaks about impartial investigation. Article 13 which speaks about right of complaint. They all have been extended to Article 16 that is which speaks about prohibition of cruel, inhuman, degrading treatment or punishment. Now we are coming to another most important part of the presentation that is enforcement of the convention. How a convention can be enforced? Well, the convention provides for committee against torture. The relevant provisions run from Article 17 to 24 in part 2 of the convention. Well, the body consists of 10 experts who are national of the state parties who are elected through a secret ballot, consideration being given to the equitable geographical distribution and to the usefulness of the participation of persons having legal experience. So people having legal experience in this field and of course they must be expert should be elected to the body of convention against torture, committee against torture. Well, Article 19 is another important provision which casts duty on the state parties to submit reports, to submit periodic report to the Committee Against Torture about what actions they have taken to implement the Torture Convention and to prohibit acts of torture under their jurisdiction. Now such comments, such report is subject to committee's revision and comments. Article 20 is a very important provision which gives the power of investigation to the Committee Against Torture. If the Committee Against Torture is, the, is of the opinion that some allegation of torture has taken place in some jurisdiction, that is a state party, or it has come to know from some sources, it can invite the state party to come and explain the allegation led against it. And also it has got the right to physically visit the state jurisdiction. But again, the right to visit a state is subject to the qualification that the concerned state should have consented to the fact that 
the torture committee can come and visit it. Otherwise, they are, it's not possible to visit the concerned state. Article 22, another provision, which gives the individual to file complaints. That is, it gives the individual to file complaint directly against the state if they are being subject to torture. But again, this is further qualified that, uh, qualified with the fact that if the state has consented to this provision and has not made any reservation to the contrary, then only a citizen can file a complaint against its own state for not following it, the convention or for committing acts of torture. Now, Article 21 also speaks about the interstate complaint procedure. It means one state can file a complaint against another state if the another state is committing acts of torture. But again, this is further qualified with the same thing that both states should have consented so such agreement, otherwise this is not possible. Now we are coming to the last part of the presentation as to India and Convention Against Torture. What are the provisions in India which prohibits torture? This is very important for us to understand. Well, let me tell you one small fact that torture, acts, acts of torture can be punished in India through provision of IPC, but there is no such offense of torture under the Indian jurisdiction. Though there was a bill, it was introduced in 2010, that's called Torture Bill 2010, but it has lapsed for some purposes which we will discuss in the later part of my presentation. India signed the convention on 14 October 1997 and yet we are still to have any enabling legislations to implement the torture convention. Well, what is the provision under which acts of torture can be punished in India? The most important provision under the IPC are section 30, 330 and section 331. They speak about causing of hurt and grievous hurt to extort confession or to compel restoration of property. They speak about, I repeat, causing of hurt and grievous hurt to extort confession and compel restoration of property. This provision can be used to punish acts of torture. Similarly, 348 of the Indian Penal Code speaks about wrongfully confining a person for the purpose of extracting a confession of, or other information. It must similarly be used to prosecute acts of torture. Another important provision is section 166 of the Indian Penal Code. It says about to punish public servant who are charged with disobeying the law with the intent to cause injury to people. Similarly, section 24 of the Evidence Act speaks about it protects confession of accused from being admitted as evidence if it has been caused by inducement, threat or promise by a person in authority. Again, self-explanatory. And the last provision which can be used to punish acts of torture is section 54 of the CRPC, which casts a duty on all the magistrate. When a person is taken to him before placing him into custody, it's a duty of the magistrate to ask him whether he has been subject to any acts of torture or cruel inhuman treatment or punishment. And he should also state to the victim that he has a right to be medically examined. Now, let me tell you something about the torture bill and after that we will wrap up this presentation. Well, India introduced the Torture Bill 2010 with the intent to implement the Torture Convention. We all know that India is a dualist country and we need to have enabling legislation to implement international law. The Torture Bill 2010 was introduced and it was met with a lot of criticisms. The matter was the bill was passed by the Lok Sabha, but when it was sent to the Ras Sabha for being passed, a lot of criticisms were raised by the various civil society organizations, international institutions, for not being in compliance with the international law. And the matter was sent to the select committee. After that, a revision of the bill was brought. But the rev revised bill is still pending with the Home Ministry. But when we, when you see the provisions of the original bill and the revised bill, you will find a lot of contrast. And the revised bill, to a large extent, is in compliance with the international law. Let's see some of the important provisions of the original bill as compared with the revised bill. Well, first, definition of torture. Well, in the original bill, that is 2010, which was passed by the Lok Sabha, it defined torture as causing of grievous hurt to any person or danger to life, limb or health, whether mental or physical, by a public servant or with the connivance of a public servant or at the instigation of a public servant for the purpose of obtaining information and confession. So the definition is quite limited in nature. I'm sure if you are remembering the international part which I had said, the purposes, was, the purposes were quite elaborate. In this, there is just one purpose, that is, for the purpose of obtaining information and confession and causing a grievous hurt to any person or danger to life, limb or health. 
That's it. But the revised bill has quite extended definition. It says, it defines torture as causing of grievous hurt to any person, danger to life, limb or health of any person, or severe mental agony, trauma, or suffering caused by cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment by a public servant or with the connivance or at the instigation of public servant. So you see the definition of torture is quite wide in the revised bill. Now, coming to the purposes. As I said long back that torture should be committed with a certain purpose as that was explained in the international part. Similarly, that purpose has also been retained in the original bill 2010 and the revised bill. As I had said, the torture bill 2010, the purpose was quite limited. But the revised bill, in the revised bill, the torture has been quite elaborated and to a large extent it is in compliance with the international. Let's see what purposes have been mentioned in the torture bill 2010. It says that. An act will be considered as an act of torture if it is caused for the purpose of extorting from him or any person interested in him, in him any confession or any information which may lead to the detection of any offense or misconduct and on the ground of his religion, race, place of birth, residence, language, caste or community or any other ground whatsoever. So they are just two purposes first. It should be committed for extorting from him or any person, confession or information which may lead to the detection of an offence or some misconduct and it should be committed on some discriminatory basis that is religion, race, place of birth, language, caste, etc. But when you see the definition of purpose, what are the purposes under the revised bill? It is in compliance with international to a large extent. Well, let me tell you what are the purposes. First of all, it should be committed intentionally. Again, that's quite clear and quite compliant with the international law. It should be committed for the purpose of obtaining information or confession from any person, number one, which was there in the international law, to punish any person for any act committed or suspected to having committed, again, to an incompletely international law, as we say, read, read in the Article 1 of the Torture Convention. Third is, intimidating or coercing such person which may lead to detection of an offence, again, incompletely international law, or misconduct or discrimination on the ground of religion, race, sex, place of residence, birth, language, caste, sect, color or community or commits any act for any other purpose. The last is commits any other act for any other purpose. See, it's quite elaborate again, just like the fourth criteria in international law. So to a large extent, the purposes are quite in harmony with the international law. Now, in the original bill 2010, there was no provision on body and proof in case of torture committed in case of police custody. Suppose if a person has been taken into police custody and marks of injuries are there. So there was no provision for this in the original bill, but in the original bill. But in the 2010 bill, sorry, in the revised bill, which is still pending consideration of the Home Ministry, there is a provision that if a person has been taken into custody and there are marks of injury, it's a duty of the police. It's a burden of proof, burden of proof is on the police to prove that the acts were not committed intentionally. Now, coming to another important provision, in the original bill 2010 and the revised bill. The revised bill, 2000, the revised bill has given an illustration as to what all acts can constitute torture. There was no such provision in the torture bill 2010. But the revised bill has stated something, what all can be a torture under the revised bill. Well, to give you examples and to draw your attention, systematic beating, head banging, punching, kicking, striking with truncheon or rifle butt, or similar other objects or jumping on the stomach. If such things are being done, it will be an act of torture as mentioned in the revised torture bill. Similarly, food deprivation or forcible feeding with spoiled food, animal or human excreta or other stuff or substances not normally eaten. Electric shock, cigarette burning, burning by heated rods, hot oil or acid or by rubbing of pepper or other chemical substances including spices or acids on mucous membranes or on the wounds. The next is submersion of head in water or water polluted, with, water polluted with urine, vomit or blood. Rape or threat thereof and sexual abuse of any kind including sodomy, insertion of foreign objects into the sex organ or rectum or electric shock to the genitals. Mutilation or amputation of any part of the body such as genitalia, ear or tongue. The use of plastic bag or other materials placed over the head or to the point of expatiation, 
the use of psychotic drugs to change the perception, memory, alertness, or will of a person. Maltreating members of the family or person and inflicting shame upon the victim or anyone by acts such as stripping of the person naked, parading him in a public place, saving the victim head, or putting marks on his body against the will. So you see, a quite the revised torture bill has quite given a large number of illustrations as to, as to what can constitute torture. And whatever we have just now read from the revised bill, such things do happen in the everyday use. And everyone will appreciate and admit that such things are committed and we all read such things happening in the newspapers. The best part is that they have also extended the protection to the family members. It says, I repeat again, maltreating members of the family or any other person or inflicting shame upon the victim or any one of them as stripping the person naked, parading him in a public place, saving the victim head or putting marks on his body against his will or any other analogous acts of mental or psychological torture. Last is torture of children in any form. Now, torture of children in any form is something prohibited totally under the new revised torture bill. Well, another important thing is defense of justification times of war or emergency. Well, there was no provision in the torture bill 2010, but again, the revised bill 2010 has a provision for defense of justification times of war or emergency such defense cannot be taken by the government. Now, minimum sentence for act of torture, the original bill has a minimum has prescribed for a minimum sentence of 10 years. But this is only there if a person, if the action is proved, if the commission is proved, then only person can be guilty. Act attempt is not punishable under the original bill. In the revised bill, minimum sentence of three years has been provided and a maximum sentence of 10 years has been provided. And not only the commission, but even the attempt has been punished. Witness protection, no provision in the original bill 2010. But in the revised bill, there is a provision of witness protection that the state should take all measures to protect the victim and witnesses from all kinds of ill treatment, violence, threat, or any other harm or mental trauma. Coming to the next part, limitation for filing a complaint. Under the original bill, a complaint can only be filed within six months, but the time period has been extended in the revised bill. It can be filed within two years. So this is another positive development which has happened in the revised bill. Coming to the next part, complaint by any other victim. There was no provision in the original bill. In the revised bill, complaint can be filed by the victim or his any other friend or his representative if he is not in the capacity of filing complaint because of his health or financial incapacity or otherwise. Coming again to the next part, medical examination after remand to the custody. No provision in the original bill, but there is a provision in the revised bill. If a person is being sent to the police custody, compulsory medical examination of that person should be there. Now I'm coming to the last part of the slide. It speaks about the compensation, which is very much important. Well, in the original bill 2010, there was no provision for compensation and it was not in compliance with the international law. But in the revised bill, which is presently pending consideration under the Home Ministry, it has provided for compensation to the victims of torsion and it is also provided for what all consideration has to be taken to provide compensation to the victims of torsion. Few of them are like gravity of the physical or mental harm or the lost opportunities or lost education or material damages or loss of earning or cost of litigation, medicine, etc. The following things have to be taken into consideration by the government before giving compensation to the victim of torsion. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure after listening to my presentation, you would be in a position to appreciate the meaning of torture as provided in international law, the basic elements of torture as given under the torture convention, the important decisions of the international courts and how they have liberally interpreted the various elements of international law. And of course, the torture bill 2010 and the revised bill, which to a large extent is following the provisions of the international law. With this, I would like to thank everybody for your patience and cooperation. I thank you once again. Thank you very much.